Remember that both the clavicle and the scapula are forming the pectoral girdle. Now, as part of the upper limb, we have three bones. We have the humerus in the arm, we have the radius, and we have the ulna as part of the forearm. After that, both bones will articulate with the carpal bones on the wrist and therefore with the hand bones, such as these metacarpal bones and then the phalanges. Hey guys, welcome back to another video. This is Dr. Gonzalez here. And today we are gonna talk about the following topics. But before we get started, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share so that you can always receive notifications of when I'm posting new videos every single week. So here we go, let's get started. Bones are grouped into the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. So here is the axial skeleton and here's the appendicular skeleton. The 126 bones of the appendicular skeleton are primarily concerned with movement. As appendages to the central skeleton, these bones include those on the upper and lower limbs including the girdles that attach them to the axial skeleton. However, in total, there are over 206 bones in the human skeleton. So the clavicle or collarbone, it's a bone we have here on this area of our chest and is S-shaped. It's medial or sternal and articulates with the manubrium of the sternum and it's lateral or acromial and articulates with the acromion of the scapula. Now the scapula, it's also known as the shoulder blade, and it's a flat bone that is located on the posterior part of the thorax, superiorly between ribs second and seven. Its glenoid cavity is the attachment point for the humerus, which is this bone right here. And the humerus, it's your arm bone. Anteriorly, it looks like this. Posteriorly, it looks like this. And we know this because of the bone markings that we can observe. For example, posteriorly, you will observe this structure right here that is called the spine. And the spine is continuous with the acromion. Now, posteriorly, you can observe there are two fossas. Number one is this one, the supraspinous fossa, and supraspinous is superior to the spine, which is this structure over here. Inferior to the spine, we have the infraspinous fossa. Now, notice how the scapula also has a couple of borders. The most superior border is called actually superior border. This one is the medial border in light blue, and this one is the lateral border in light blue. Also, the scapula has several angles, including the superior angle, as shown in here, and the inferior angle. If we rotate the scapula to a lateral view, this is how it looks like, and you can observe again the acromion, and you can observe the lateral border. Now, notice how there's another structure that it's called the glenoid cavity. In the glenoid cavity, remember, this is the area that articulates with the humerus of your arm. Now, if we rotate the scapula anteriorly, notice how we have another fossa called the subscapular fossa in light blue. And also from the anterior view, you can observe other bone markings such as this coracoid process. And you can observe one more time the angles like the superior angle and inferior angle as well as the borders, medial border and lateral border and superior border. Last but not least, there is a notch over here called the, the, the scapular notch. 
also known as suprascapular notch. Now the humerus or the arm bone articulates with the scapula proximally. Its rounded head fits into the glenoid cavity as you can observe right here. And the humerus articulates with the radius and the ulna distally, right? So the trochlea articulates with the ulna and the capitulum with the radius. And starting from the most superior and proximal part of this bone, we have the head of the humerus. And the head also has a neck. In this case, this is also known as the anatomical neck. Then we have a lesser tubercle. And if there's a lesser, there's also a greater tubercle. In between both tubercles, there is an intertubercular groove. Also, this intertubercular groove, it's also known as the sulcus or intertubercular sulcus. Inferior to these two lesser and greater tubercles, we have another neck called the surgical neck, as you can observe in light blue. This part that was yellow and now is light blue is the shaft or body of the bone. And notice that now medially, over the shaft, there's an, a deltoid tuberosity. Over the most distal portion of the humerus, there are other structures. These structures are mostly anterior, as you can observe. Then we're gonna go into, into the posterior view. But anteriorly, you can observe this structure called the trochlea in light blue. And proximal to it, it's the capitulum. Also, you can observe medially the medial epicondyle. And if there's a medial epicondyle, as zoom, there's also a lateral epicondyle on the lateral view. There's also two fossas. This one in light blue, it's called the coronoid fossa. And this one in light blue, it's called the radial fossa. Now let's take a look at the posterior view of the humerus. And posteriorly, you can observe almost every single structure that we mentioned before, such as the head. You can observe the greater tubercle. You can observe, for example, the surgical neck and of course the shaft. Now, over here on the distal part, you can observe one fossa called the olecranon fossa, as well as the medial epicondyle and lateral epicondyle. This fossa right here is going to work for articulation with the olecranon of the ulna. Now the ulna and the radius are two bones of the forearm, which is this part right here. The olecranon and coronoid process at the proximal end of the ulna form the trochlear notch, which wraps around the trochlea of the humerus, making up the elbow joint as such. Now the radius is located on the lateral thumb, lateral or thumb side of the forearm. And in this case, the articulation of its head with the capitulum of the humerus and with the ulna allow the forearm to rotate like such or like such. Now the ulna is one of the bones that are located on your forearm and it has several bone markings. Starting with the most superior or proximal ones, you can observe on this lateral view, the trochlear notch. Posteriorly, you can observe the structure that is called the olecranon. And this is the structure that articulates with the olecranon fossa that I show you on the humerus. You can also, also observe this trochlear notch one more time 
and here the coronoid process. The coronoid process articulates also with the humerus. Notice how there's also an area called the tuberosity and there's a radial notch that articulates with the head of the radius. In orange and now light blue, this is called the shaft. And most distally we have the head of the ulna and there's also the stylite process of the ulna. And the radius has several bone markings, starting with the most superior or proximal bone markings we have the head of the radius and the head also has a neck, so the neck of the radius. Then there's the tubercle of the radius and now in light blue, this is the shaft. Lastly, on the radius, we can see the styloid process in light blue. Now let's talk about the carpal or wrist bones. These are eight small bones connected to each other by ligaments. They are arranged into two rows of four bones each. The proximal row has the scaphoid, lunate, trichytrum, and pisiform, and these bones articulate with the distal radius and ulna. Now the distal row, um, which are the bones trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and amate, they articulate with the metacarpals of the hand, right? So are these bones right here. The lunate, the scaphoid, the trapezium, and the trapezoid. This one's the capitate, amate, trichatral, and pisiform on the anterior side of the wrist metacarpals and phalanges well that's it thank you for watching this video don't forget to subscribe like and share also if you have any comments don't forget to comment on the section down below